So those were that set of changes that occurred in 2016. And then we got to 2017, although it didn't go into effect till July 1st. Tell us yeah. about that next shift. So um, at the same time all this was happening, um, the Department of Healthcare and Family Services, HFS for short, um, ha has maintained a, they're responsible for a lot of the enforcement of child support. They receive a lot of federal money and they're under a lot of federal requirements on uh, making sure that uh, that parents are paying their child support. So they, they maintain this child support enforcement, uh, I'm sorry, um, child support advocacy committee, which I ended up becoming a member of. And they were had concurrently been working on um, updating the economic study that the, sure. the feds require to make sure that our child support uh, methods are keeping up and make and you know ensuring that the kids are being provided for. And as part of this study, they started looking at the majority thirty or 30 uh, I forget the number states, thirty plus yeah. states who have, have moved from guideline child support to um, the income shares model. So there was a ton of work that had to be done um, in, to study that and to figure out um, whether this was best for Illinois. And at the end of the, the day, the, the members of that committee, HFS, the Attorney General's Office, advocates, right. uh, people all over the board decided um, it was. It's a more uh, complicated implementation than child support and there the calculation can be more um, more complicated because instead of just looking at you know the the one parent the payer parents income you're looking at both and right. it, it's just a little it, it can be a little more complicated although they've done a good job I think HFS at putting out the the table charts and the, right. the charts and the calculation so you know once and, and that training their folks on helping people who are not represented um, you know, be able to work with those charges right, as well. Right, and to determine. And as a family law practitioner, it's always interesting to me because you'll see people who are coming in for the first time and they've already been to the website and they've done those calculations to try to figure out what that child support is. So under the old system that you paid a percentage of the net by the payer right. only, the one who did not have the primary care of the children, and then now it's that income share. But it's interesting to me because one of the things that you know becomes an element of it is you have somebody who maybe didn't work, but the statute also allows the imputation of income if they didn't work in the past. Exactly. And then the court has the authority to impute income beyond that under certain factors that the court can consider. And, so. and it also provided um, for you know what one of the the stubborn problems is. Um, Folks who owe child support but then are incarcerated, and 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 they either don't have the know-how or the resources to try and get their um, child support stopped. Um, stopped while they're incarcerated, right. and then they come out and they've got this big arrearage built up, which it just it, it, it just becomes problems a cycle. in their life, right? It, it, and so, um, even though HFS does have um, does have resources for people to right. do that. Not everybody knows how to access them, et cetera. Right. So there were some changes in the in the bill that made that process a little bit. It's easier. cleaner, cleaner, yeah. and easier in that sense. Exactly. Right. And then the other thing is, is that you know it is based upon net income. So then you always have the difficulty of getting to that net income yeah. change. And then I think that where I've seen as a practitioner, some of the questions is, is if you had an old child support order, when do you qualify to modify that? And right. so that has spun off some difference of opinions and we're seeing that so it'll be time and it will take time for the appellate yes. courts to rule on that to determine when is it appropriate, what does it take to require a modification. Right. But, and I think one thing that's clear though is that the changing, changing of the um, statute is not in itself a, a grounds for modification. That's correct. So even right. if, you, if you ran the numbers and realized that you'd be better off one way or the other under right. the new statute, that alone is not enough to give you grounds for correct. the modification. But what's interesting is, is if one party maybe yeah. who wasn't the recipient before, if their income goes yes, up, yeah. can you move in for a modification? And I think we're seeing some difference of opinion on that. Yeah. And so it'll be interesting to see how that works out. But I think that anytime you adopt any major change like this, it's gonna take time and there's gonna to be work some. Out and, and there are, and I, I think one thing that, you know, to keep in mind is yes, it's a change for us, but it is, it's the way that it's moving and that states are overwhelmingly adopting um, this the income shares income. model. Right. And so any glitches or problems that we have, another state has had those. Right. So um, the Child Support um, Advisory Council is still in effect and they meet uh, 
quarterly, I think we meet quarterly, and they're always getting input on how this thing is working. Sure. And, um, you know, there's always, it, statutes were made to be amended. <laughs> right, well they have to evolve over time in exactly. order to make them work. And the other thing that's interesting, I think that, you know, does it give the motivation to people to make more money? Because potentially you make more money, you're going to pay more, or if you're the recipient, you might lose more. So there's some of that philosophical yes. change that I think has to work out as well. And I'm not sure that the state has dealt with all those issues, right. you know, as they're practically applied. You're right. And any new statutory scheme is never going to be applied in a perfect sense. Exactly. You know, there's not a one size fits all dimension. And that's why the statute itself does give the courts the authority to modify the guidelines as well. So that's one of the things I think that's interesting is that, you know, the state charts are applicable in all counties. Right. And we know for a fact that some counties are certainly a different economic level or an economic cost than other levels, Yes, you know, other counties. And so I think that that variation, it'll be interesting to see if the judges in those counties are applying it a little differently. Yeah. So these are just things that are going to occur because it's just a natural right. evolution. And then we get to the current bill that I want to talk about, which is the new change that goes into effect January 1, 2019. And we invited you when we, we realized you're a sponsor of that bill yeah. along with Senator Hastings. So so after we finished the income um, shares, I literally said to the uh, these attorneys who I'd been working with on and off for now four years, sure, I never want to deal with another domestic yeah, you wanted a relations break. bill ever right. again. And voila, the tax um, the tax changes on the federal level happened that necessitated changes to our maintenance statute. And not only the Illinois maintenance statute, but every Everybody's state right. has, has to um, uh, adopt some changes. So again, that was a lot of working through exactly how um, that would be. But the, the, the crux is that under the prior tax law, um, maintenance could be deductible right. to the payor and taxable income to the payee but because of the way it was um, al because of those abilities it you could generally net out more money because right. the payor was generally at a higher tax level correct than the payee so um, there so with the changes now those aren't deductible anymore so right. it requires a whole different a whole new calculation framework. right um, and so the good news is for anybody who is already um, uh, paying out paying maintenance under an order that you're grandfathered in you're, right it doesn't change it's for new new um, cases new right. cases coming in so the ones that people are divorced after january 1 2019 exactly. and then for all of you listening so this was the history of the modernization of the illinois family law and we're going to do a separate presentation on the specifics of the new maintenance bill based upon net income which i think a lot of people are going to be interested in and it's certainly going to change a lot of the framework and so we'll talk about that in a few minutes so thank you for joining us, and I appreciate your time today. My pleasure. It's very interesting to see this evolution, and I think it's important for people going through a divorce to understand. You know, these are new terms, these are new history, and so when an attorney says to you, "Listen, this is what it is. This is what I think it is," but the appellate court could change it. That's why you are in this new statutory scheme. And remember, you said seventy-seven was the last yep. time that they had it. So all the way to two thousand fifteen, two thousand sixteen, really when the full yes. act was amended. So very interesting conversation. Thank you so much.